Hello everyone and welcome to my channel Chase and Sex Ed where I chase the sex education for you. And my name is Chase. So let's get started. Hello, my name is Chase and I identify as a queer trans man. I am also a comprehensive adolescent pregnancy prevention educator, or CAP educator for short. I joined together with family peer advocate Karen Fuller, who is a parent of a trans teen, to develop a curriculum for parents of trans and gender expansive youth to teach them how to talk to their kids about sex education. I hope you enjoy. I am here with my coworker, Karen Fuller, who is a credentialed family care advocate in the state of New York, and she specializes in trans families. Hello, everybody. <laughs> well, thanks for being here. What are your pronouns, Karen? My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And hers, awesome. And tell me a little about what you do at work. Okay, so I am a credentialed family care advocate, as you said, and I work with parents and caregivers of LGBTQ, youth and I focus specifically on parents of trans and gender expansive youth. So I got the opportunity to grow up with Karen. My mom actually went to parent group at the time with her and now Karen actually runs that same parent group. So we go way back and we kind of became a dynamic duo and we created a lot of education for parents of trans youth and for the trans youth themselves. So I'm sure Karen will be on another time besides this video and I am super excited. So am I. <laughs> <laughs> so today we are doing our presentation, Sex Education for Parents of Trans and Gender Expansive Youth. There's gonna be some great information that anybody can take away. So in today's presentation, we are gonna go over five things with y'all. The first thing that we're gonna do is go over what is the risk? What is the risk for STIs or unattended pregnancy for trans youth? Next, we're gonna talk about how to talk about sex with your teen. Then we're gonna go over birth control options with gender affirming hormones. We'll be covering using barrier methods. And then we're gonna end with sex toys and prosthetics. So Chase, tell me, what are the risks? Well, unfortunately, we don't really know. And there's not enough accurate research. As a former HIV tester, I can tell you that a lot of the times in the state, people who are trans are counted as sex assigned as birth when they're being tested and not as their true gender identity. And then there's also a lot of people who aren't out as trans. So that skews the numbers when it comes to research that comes out of New York State. But what we do know is that transgender women are at a higher risk than men for HIV, and that gender affirming hormones don't prevent pregnancy, um, which is a common misconception. Being on gender affirming hormones can lower the ability to get pregnant or to get somebody else pregnant, but it does not um, it's not considered enough to be a form of birth control. So here are some stats from the CDC about what we do know about HIV and transgender people. In 2017, the percentage of transgender people who received a new HIV diagnosis was three times the national average. Nearly two thirds of transgender women and men surveyed in 2014 and 2015 reported never testing for HIV. And in 2019, an estimated 14% of transgender women had HIV. Wow, so if you think about how many people who are trans who aren't getting tested when the ones who did showed to be three times the national average, just imagine how many people have HIV who are transgender who don't even know it. Right. All right, so Karen, why are trans people at a higher risk than cis people for HIV? I would say because there's stigma, discrimination, a lot of social rejection and exclusion overall. I'd have to agree. Like take, for example, a transgender youth who's like under the age of 18, who's been kicked out of their home because they now openly identify as being trans. Um, they've just lost their health care because they're on their parents' insurance. They don't have a way to get to school because, you know, where's the school bus going to pick them up if they're not at their house? They are too young to hold a job. They, lost, they just lost their housing. They have no place to live. So they're now on the street or in shelter, and they're probably turning to sex work or, like, the selling of drugs just to survive. Yeah, exactly. And that's, you know, overall, that's what I try to avoid with families that I work with. Um, my goal is always to get parents and their youth on the same page. 
So we are now moving on to where we're going to discuss how to talk to your teens about having sex. Um, so here are some great tips that you can use. One, not all at once. It's too much information to possibly give one teen at once where they're going to really remember and get what they need out of it. I recommend small conversations over a long period of time, ideally starting with puberty conversations so that your, your kid knows that you are a trustworthy, non-judgmental person that they can come to about sexual health issues. Two, you won't have all the answers. It's impossible to have all the answers. What I recommend is taking that opportunity to look up the correct information together. And so you are creating this bond with your kid where they know, even if you don't have the answers, you're going to help them find it. Three, use the words internal organs and external organs instead of penis and vagina. This way, if you have a trans teen who is has a lot of dysphoria with their parts, you're not bringing up any negative emotions around that and you're kind of just giving a general um, internal organs or external organs. And you can even say people with penises and people with vaginas. It just depends on what your teen is comfortable with, which brings me to my fourth tip. Ask what terminology they're comfortable with. If you don't know, it's totally okay to ask them um, and just try your best to use whatever terminology that they're comfortable with. Mistakes happen. If you accidentally say the wrong thing, just be like, oops, sorry, correct yourself and move on. And my next tip is stay away from pronouns like he and she. This way you will not be assuming the gender of your teen's future partner. And you're really coming at this in a non-judgmental way where you're not implying that they need to be straight or hetero in a heterosexual relationship. Stay away from the word should. Should is almost like telling them what they have to do. And teens are very stubborn. Oh, yes, they are. Yes. Um, <laughs> and so be telling them that you should use condoms. They're going to want to do the exact opposite. Exactly. Try to word things in a way where it makes sense to them to do it instead of them feeling like, oh, you're just my parent telling me to do this. So instead of saying you should use condoms, you can say something like using condoms will protect you from HIV and STIs. And lastly, stay away from personal questions. I know that this is your child and they're always going to be your baby and you want to make sure that they are 100% safe all the time. But the last thing your, your teen is going to want to do is answer really personal questions. And that doesn't mean that you don't ask them what you need to know about their health medically. That's like, are you sleeping with Kyle? Um, and like asking the details of the type of sex that they may be having you're more likely to get backlash to where your teen isn't going to want to talk to you at all if you go down the route of personal questions. I recommend instead that you start those small conversations over time so that your teen feels comfortable enough to come to you with the more personal details if they need. Why these tips are so important, why they make sense to use with your trans teen. So if we take a look at this, uh, what's called the trauma resiliency model, my therapist actually showed this to me a while ago and I've used it in my education ever since. So if we look between these blue dotted lines, that solid black wave, that's the normal highs and lows of everyone's day. But if you have a traumatic event, like a trigger of a traumatic event doesn't need to be anything really substantial. People think that trauma has to be like a really bad car accident, something really gory or like war. For a trans youth can just be constantly being misgendered, constantly being dead named, things like that. So if you're if you use pronouns like he and she, that's going to be that electric bolt that comes in. And then you see the red line of where they can either go all the way up to edgy, irritable, mania, anxiety, and panic, angry outbursts and pain, or all the way down to depression, sadness, isolation, exhaustion, fatigue, and numbness. So if they go all the way up there, you're most likely going to have a screaming match with your teen and they're they're not going to want to talk to you and they're not going to be hearing anything you're saying. If they go all the way down, they're either going to just ignore you or they're going to yes or know you to death and they're really not listening and getting the information that they need either. We're going to talk about what to do if you're getting pushback from your teen. Okay, so first you want to show that you care. Um, you can say something like, this is really important info and I want to make sure you have it. Or a second, you want to acknowledge discomfort. You can say something like, this conversation might be uncomfortable, but it's important and we need to have it. And then number three, don't assume. 
I'm not assuming you're having sex or encouraging it. One day you'll have to decide to be sexually, sexually active or not. When that day comes, I want to be sure you have the tools to stay safe. That's a really good one. That's like my favorite one because a, a lot of the parents are like, well, my kid just keeps telling me that like, I'm not having sex. Why do we need to talk about this? Right. And it's not that they're having sex right now. It's that they're going to have to make that decision. Exactly. So, and you're just a parent that's looking out for their best interest. Right. Hey, Karen. So birth control is broken up into three different categories. Do you know what they are? I bet I do. Abstinence over-the-counter, and prescribed. Yes. So abstinence is the safest and most effective method of birth control there is, but it requires skill. So it's really important that you talk to your teen about the skills that abstinence requires, and you don't just say, just don't do it, and leave it at that. And it's important that you always come up with a backup method with your teen in case they are in a situation where they um, don't stay abstinent in that moment. Next is over-the-counter. Do you know what over-the-counter methods there are? Uh, condoms, mm -hmm. internal and external. Yep. Uh, dental dams. Mm -hmm. Yep. So any type of barrier method that you can get um, at like Walmart, any type of drugstore that is around you, that's going to be considered over-the-counter because you don't need a prescription method, which is the last category, prescribed. And prescribed methods include the pill, the patch, the ring, the shot, implant, IUD, and more. Skills that you want to teach your teen to stay abstinent are empathy or knowing how the other person feels, listening and or hearing the other person and speaking, being clear and setting boundaries. And the best way to do that, in my opinion, is something called the SWAT technique, which I uh, took from a curriculum called Be Proud, Be Responsible that I am trained in. It was developed by Act for Youth and Cornell University. So the SWAT technique stands for S, say no. Say no to whatever behavior you're, um, that is being asked of you or forced upon you. So say, no, I don't wanna have sex. And then W, which is explain why. So no, I don't want to have sex. We don't have condoms. No, I don't want to have sex. I'm just not ready, whatever the reason is. And then A is provide alternatives. So I don't want to have sex, but we can go see a movie. Or we don't have condoms, let's go buy some. And then T is talk it out. We do role playing um, or skits as we like to call them to make the teens a little less, less nervous. Practicing using the SWAT technique. I really recommend this so that they can learn to talk it out, what that might look like, how it's going to feel, and how to say a strong no so that your teen has the confidence to say no instead of looking down at the floor and being like, no. It's really important that you teach these skills if you are looking for your teen to stay absent. Okay, so we are moving on to barrier methods. So I'm going to demonstrate how to demonstrate them for your teen. So I'm gonna start with the external condom. And you can use anything you have around the house, usually a vegetable or a fruit, like a carrot or a banana works just fine. So Karen, what's the first step in using condoms? Uh, check the expiration date. Eh, that's not a bad answer. but. We always teach teens as CAP educators that the first step to using a condom is having a condom. If you don't teach your teens to carry condoms, they're not gonna have them in the moment when they need them. That makes sense. You can talk to them about getting a condom wallet, which is a wallet that protects the condom when it's in your pocket, where regular wallets do not do that. They make condom keychains um, to put on backpacks and, you know, the key ring and stuff like that. So I recommend looking up those items and maybe recommending them to your teen, depending on what, what age they are. Then you can check the expiration date. Okay. And this one is good. What else do we want to do? Check for holes in the packaging. Yes. You can do that just by squeezing. And if you feel the air pocket is in there, that means that the wrapper is not compromised and there are no holes. Then we're ready to open. So to open a condom, you want to push it off to the side, pinch in the corner, and pull straight down. Be careful if you have long nails, especially acrylic nails, you can put a hole in the condom. So I recommend just pushing it out like this and removing. So Karen, now that I have my condom, how do I know which way, what, what's the right way to, to do this? Um, I don't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> so if you can put your thumb and point your finger on each side and you can start to roll the condom down, that's how you know it's the right way. If it's the other way, it's not gonna roll down for you. It's gonna get stuck. And that's how you know, even in the dark, if the condom is the right way. You are then going to pinch the tip and we do this to leave room for the semen. So a lot of people say, oh, if you don't leave room, it's gonna break the condom. It's less likely to break the condom. What's more likely is that it's going to go down the sides of the penis and spill out of the condom and then exposing your partner to STIs, HIV, and an unattended pregnancy. So pinch the tip. We're going to place it on the head of the penis when the penis is fully erect and then you can slide it all the way down. You then do the do, whatever that is for you, and you want to pull out and turn away from your partner to take the condom off. And you want to use your hand to pinch the tip to trap the semen as you pull it up. And then I recommend tying it. It's not necessary, but it helps with spillage. So tie it in a knot, roll this up in toilet paper or a paper towel. Do not flush these. You know what happens if you flush these? You'll have a huge plumbing bill, I imagine. You will have a huge plumbing <laughs> bill. And if you are a teen, your parents will not be happy that they found a condom, a old okay. condom in their septic that cost them thousands of dollars. Yep. So throw this in the trash can and make sure that you put it in an area where your pet cannot get it. Dogs are great at sniffing out condoms and tampons and eating them. And this will also cause a very expensive vet bill as well. Okay, so next I am going to talk about the internal condom labeled the female condom, but that is wrong. I refer to it as the internal condom one because it's more trans inclusive and because you can use it more than in just than just a vagina. You can also use it for the back door, anal sac. Yeah. I love the internal condom for so many reasons. I think it is far superior than the external condom. One, it's always latex free. It's made of polyurethane, so you never have to worry about an allergy. Two, it's one size fits all, so your partner will never be too big or too small for this condom. Three, it is much better at withstanding body heat, so you can insert this baby up to eight hours before you have intercourse. So the excuse wow. to um, that putting a condom on ruins the mood, it goes out the door with this. You can put this on before you go out to, like a, your college kids go out to the bar before you partake in any drug, drugs or alcohol, you can already be wearing this. Lastly, it provides more protection than external condom would. So I'm gonna open this up and you're gonna see that it, there's like little, there's some of it's on the outside and that's going to help protect you from skin to skin diseases like herpes simplex one and two and strains of HPV that cause genital warts. So the instructions are pretty similar in how you get started using this, you need to have it. So always be sure that you're talking to your teen about carrying condoms. So then we can, what? Then let's check the expiration date. Check the expiration date. And for internal condoms, be sure to check both dates because there is a manufactured date and then there is an ex expiration date. And a lot of people are gonna look at the manufactured date. So this was manufactured in 2017. They're gonna be like, why are all these condoms I just bought expired? They're not. If you look at the expiration date, it doesn't expire until 2022, so you're all good. And then what else do we do, Karen? Then you've got to check for holes in the packaging. Yeah, so you're gonna need to use two hands to feel the air bubble in this. So you can push the air, there's just a little bit in there, back and forth. And if there is no air, then you know that there's a hole and you should not use it and you should get another one. What else? Now you push it to the side mm -hmm. and tear it straight down. Yes, and there's a perforated edge already on the packaging, which is amazing. And this looks a lot different than what people typically think of when they think of a condom. It's more like a pouch. And you need to give your body about five minutes at least for this to warm up to the walls of the vagina or the anus, or you're gonna feel like a plastic bag. You're literally gonna be Katy Perry singing about how you feel like a plastic bag. To demonstrate this, all you need is a hand. So you can just 
make a hole like this with your hand and explain that this is the vulva and then this is the vagina and at the end imagine that that is the cervix. So this is a lot like the Nuva ring. It's a small flexible ring. You're going to squeeze this, insert it, and push it all the way to the base of the vagina and this is going to lay over the vulva. This acts as an anchor around the cervix. Throughout sex, it is smart to make sure that you are putting your hands on it um, to be sure that it's still there because if your partner pulls out and goes in um, too low or too high, they can then just push it deep inside and then it's not protecting you at all. So make sure that you're just touching it periodically throughout sex. And then to remove this, all you have to do is twist it, pinch it to trap the semen and pull it out. And again, don't flush this down the toilet. You can tie it. I do always recommend that people tie it so things don't spill. Throw it away in the trash can where a pet cannot get to it. To use this in the anus, it's very similar, but slightly different. So take out the ring. You are going to pull this through and then insert this part into the anus. And then the ring now acts as an anchor so that the condom will not be shoved inside of the anus. You remove it the same way. All you have to do is twist, pinch, and pull it out and then throw away. Okay, so the last barrier method that I recommend talking to your teen about is a dental dam, which is a thin latex sheet that is meant to go over a vulva or an anus during oral sex. And I have one right here. <laughs> So people think that, that this might be a little weird, but dentists use this. That's why it's called a dental dam. The way that you use this is you're literally just going to lay it over uh, the vulva or the anus. You're going to hold on to it while you perform oral sex, and then you can fold it up and throw it away. Like all barrier methods, it's a one-time use thing. And there is an expiration date on the package. Be sure to check, but there is no air bubble to check. So now I'm going to talk about the birth control methods that I feel personally are going to work best with hormone affirming therapies. Now remember, I am not a doctor, I'm not an OBGYN. So always be sure that you consult your physician um, before making any decisions. But the first one I wanna talk about is the vaginal ring, which looks a little bit like this. So it's just a small flexible ring that's inserted into the vagina and sits below the cervix, a lot like the internal condom ring that I showed you. Once inserted, you're gonna leave this in place for three weeks or for four if you don't want a period. Again, you need to talk to your provider about getting a prescription that's going to last four weeks if you wanna do that. The hormones are absorbed through the vaginal walls and that's what, why I really like this method. It's a localized method of birth control. So it's gonna be a lot easier on the body and a lot easier to take with hormones than something like the pill where it's through your whole body and it's gonna be a lot easier on the liver and the kidney. This can prevent atrophy in the vagina in the, and the uterus if you start taking it right when you start testosterone. Um, so it's perfectly good to use with gender affirming hormones. Okay, so the other method of birth control I'm going to talk about is the IUD, which stands for intrauterine device. It's a small T-shaped device that's plastic or metal, and it's inserted into the uterus and removed by a medical provider. If you have a knowledgeable and sensible provider, they may have sedation options available for teens who are very dysphoric and would have a hard time going through such an invasive procedure like that. With these, your period is going to become worse before it gets better. It's really common to have cramping for anywhere from a few days to a few weeks after you get this in, but it's good for anywhere between three to 12 years, depending on which type of IUD you go with. It does not protect against STDs and it's good to use with gender affirming hormones. So there's two different ways you can go. You can go for a non-hormonal or hormonal methods. If you go for a non-hormonal method, um, it's called Paragard. There's only one. It's made of copper, which is toxic to sperm. So as the sperm enter the uterus and come in close contact with the copper, they are either going to die or they're going to like swim in circles like they're really drunk and then they can't get to the egg. This one is good for up to 12 years and it's preferred by most trans people who don't want estrogen or progesterone in, in their body. And it's, it's the most effective form of emergency contraceptive that there is on the market. But what's good to know about the non-hormonal one is that if you get this and you start testosterone, your, if you get the atrophy of the uterus, 
the Paragard is the largest IUD out of the options. And so your uterus might shrink and it could, it can cause complications and it can um, get painful. But I know plenty of trans people who are on testosterone who love the Paragard and it brings them ease, ease of mind and not having to worry that they're going to get pregnant. Another great thing about the Paragard IUD is that because there are no hormones, it's not going to affect fertility afterwards. So if you do want to get pregnant, the IUD is great because you can take it out and then you don't have to wait up to a year as some birth controls require in order to get pregnant. The other option that you have is a hormonal method and there's multiple hormonal IUDs out there and they release hormones that prevent ovulation and thicken cervical mucus to prevent the sperm from even getting in the uterus at all. They're good anywhere from three to five years, and they these ones are going to prevent the atrophy in the vagina and the uterus, which is why I, I think that they're a great option for trans individuals on testosterone out there. Because if you don't prevent the atrophy, if you get it, you cannot reverse the atrophy. So for people with ex external organs, condoms, of course, would be the first choice for people with external organs that might be taking estrogen and may um, have a hard time remaining hard, a cock ring is another option. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, if you're with a partner that has a uterus, um, you can offer to help pay for their birth control method, help remind them to take their um, birth control or offer to go with them or drive them. Mm -hmm to their appointments. And the cock ring um, is going to be really important because we often don't talk about what to do if someone can't stay hard. And if we don't talk about that, that puts someone at risk for an STI or a pregnancy mm -hmm. because the condom will fall off. So cock rings are great. I recommend something that's thicker rather than thinner for your first time. And you can also try out a penis pump. So if you have a hard time getting hard, because um, it can be difficult for some people who are on estrogen, you can get a penis pump for like $16 at an adult entertainment shop or even online. Some doctors even prescribe penis pumps for people who have erectile dysfunction. And what it does is it sucks the blood into the penis and then you can put the cock ring on and you'll be all ready to go. Oh, wow, great. So we are moving on to sex toys and prosthetics. So why would somebody who's trans want a sex toy or a prosthetic? Well, it might be because they're not comfortable with their parts and a sex toy prosthetic can help eliminate dysphoria. They may want to have penetrative sex in order to feel closer to their partner. So being able to buy a toy or prosthetic that would allow them to do that um, is very appealing. It might be for masturbation. Some people who are trans might not feel comfortable touching their themselves with their hands. So they might want to use an object to do that to help eliminate some of the dysphoria while they pleasure themselves. And let's be real, just because it's fun and it feels good. That's why most people use sex toys and prosthetics. It's human nature, I guess. And just some quotes from Forbes magazine to kind of put into perspective why it's important to talk about sex toys and prosthetics with teens. So globally, the sex toy industry is predicted to grow by 9.9 .9 billion between 2019 and 2023. Wow. So a lot of people are using sex toys and prosthetics and they're just not talking Market giants may be content to sell exclusively to straight cisgender people. Independent retailers are reporting increased demand for inclusive gender neutral designs and marketing, and many retailers are adapting. So we have more options for trans people than ever before um, when it comes to gender neutral marketing and products designed specifically for trans people. And lastly, even if everyone were cisgender, that doesn't mean they'd all use the toy in the same way. People want to explore sexual pleasure for themselves and don't necessarily want to be told how to use something. So it's not just trans people who are over the gendered marketing. Cis right. people are as well. They're, we're sick of going into adult entertainment shores, store, shores, stores and seeing just like woman on the on the cover of a product right. when a product could be used to also stimulate someone who identifies as male right right and talking about it so karen what should we talk to our teens about when it comes to sex toys and prosthetics you want to let your kids know that the toys and prosthetics can submit um, transmit sti and hiv 
it's still possible. A lot of them are porous and therefore, you know, they can hold that um, STI or HIV. But you also want to use condoms if you're going to share them for the same reason, right? Because they can spread HIV and STI. You want to talk about what materials, you know, are good, what, what they're made of. Um, what ones do you recommend? I always recommend either metal, glass, or 100% medical grade silicone. Because anything that is a jelly material is going to be really porous and is just an infection waiting to happen. You also want to let them know, you know, don't use silicone lube with silicone toys. Yeah, so it's very important not to do silicone lube and silicone toys because the lube will cause the toy to break down. And when that happens, it's going to release all these toxic chemicals right into your mucous membranes where you're really the most vulnerable. Um, you want to be sure that they wash them. It's very important. Please wash them. And please, you, so many people don't realize the importance of toy cleaners. So if you do have a toy that um, is porous, so if it's not glass or metal, you want to use a toy cleaner because the soap that you use, maybe at home, like hand soap, whatever you have, can get caught in those pores. And if, if it's not rinsed all the way out, when you go to use it again, it can cause it to lather inside of you. Ugh which will burn and sting terribly, and it could cause BV. So just do yourself a favor and buy a toy cleaner. You can buy them pretty cheaply for around $5. Can you throw them in your dishwasher? Some of them. Some toys you can throw in your dishwasher, but not all. So always be sure that you check the packaging and you look up the product before you do that. And sometimes if you have a warranty, you might feel better about putting it in the dishwasher. <laughs> Some of them you can boil too. You can, oh, okay. you can boil 100% medical grade silicone to disinfect as well. And you also want to talk about the proper way to store them. Absolutely. So you want to be sure that they know that they are 100% dry before they put them away because it, the bacteria will grow it can cause infections if they are put away wet. Some prosthetics that are more realistic have higher like upkeep and maintenance and they have to be cornstarched regularly. So after you wash them, you want to cornstarch them before you put them away. I recommend storing um, silicone toys in their own separate bags so they don't touch each other because when silicone and silicone come together, it causes the toys to melt and you're wasting a lot of money mm -hmm. because these prosthetics are not cheap. Okay, just to give a recap my name is chase I identify as a queer trans man and i am a cap educator which stands for comprehensive adolescent pregnancy prevention educator and i am here with karen fuller and i am a credentialed family peer advocate straight cis woman but parent of a trans youth <laughs> and Today, we went over um, the known risks of HIV for trans individuals, how to talk to your teen about sex, birth control methods and hormone affirming therapy, using barrier methods and sex toys and prosthetics. If you like this video, please give it a like down below and subscribe to this channel and follow me on social media at Chase and Sex Ed so you are updated when my next video comes out.